Oh yeah. Did you guys hear that? All right, sharing screen. So, oh, I'm gonna move this all around. Just give me a minute here. All right, so Schoology page. So things that have been getting populated is this folder right here, the cheat sheets, notes, and knowledge checks. I've started to put a lot more stuff into it. Okay, these are all links that should go right to a Google Doc uh, of some way, shape, or form. Um, what you should do is make your own copy. So in other words, I have set the permission for you to view it and uh, only you can't edit it or anything like that. What you're going to want to do is go to your um, your Google uh, Drive and you simply make a copy. If you don't know how to do that, I mean, I can show you real quick. Um, one of the sheets that I put in here, this is called AP GoPro video review links like this is ridiculously comprehensive. Um, you should be going to this frequently. These, every single one of these things is a video link on a sort of a uh, summary of the chapters that we're reading. I mean, it literally goes like right now we're on 2.3. Congressional behavior was the last one we did. Um, these are all video reviews done by, uh, you know, various AP government people out there in YouTube land, uh, including all the Supreme Court cases. So this, all the, all the uh, required documents, like it's, it's everything. Okay. And these are all, you know, short videos, essentially, they're all somewhere around like the 10 minute mark. So if you want to go through for a, certainly for a summary is great. And the more you, you listen to these summaries, the more you remember the material. So that is part of that. But if you don't know how uh, that cheat sheet folder, if you don't know how to do it, it's real simple. You go up to file, you go to make a copy. Okay. And then you can name it whatever you want. Um, I would just probably keep what it is. And then down here on folder, what I would do is I would make an AP like I have done, and this is my personal Gmail, uh, I uh, or not Gmail, uh, my Google Drive, um, is make a folder in Google Drive that says, you know, AP GoPo or AP Gov. And then you can literally copy this document into the folder. Now you own the document. Now you have your own copy. Okay. So I strongly recommend everything that we're doing. Um, that you submit to me, I would always make a copy almost, I would say 98% of what I'm going to give you, especially in this format is going to be done through Google Docs. So you will always have, whether it's a doc or a slide or a Google sheet or whatever, um, you can always go up to file, make a copy and then put it, like make sure it goes in, not just to your Google Drive, because you'll see you have like a bunch of stuff in Google Drive and you almost will never find it. Make a folder. You can make a folder in Google Drive. Um, I'm taking valuable class time to show you this because I really think you need to do it. Like for me, this is my Google Drive. Um, you just go up to new, okay? And then you click on folder. It's that simple. Click on folder and then you can name it, you know, AP, GoPo, whatever you wanna do, create. And now you have a folder. You can see all these various folders that I've created even just within my AP Gov folder. Okay, and you can now put anything from this class into that folder. All right, so that's all the time I want to spend on that because we do need to get to things, but it is all there. Okay, and I'm going to be continuously adding to this. You can see notes on the Constitution, how to rhyme the amendments, knowledge check. This is a very comprehensive, hey, this is what we learned in Unit 1. Can I still talk about it? Uh, do I know anything about it? If not, there are also links on there to help you. Um, the unit two is on here now, the interactions among the branches. This is something that we've been talking about. I put numerous SCOTUS cheat sheets. These are different sources. So pick one that you like better. It's fine. There's that AP GoPo video review that I was just showing you. This is the filthy 50, we like to call it, parts one and two. Basically for the AP exam, it covers all the topics that you're gonna need to know. So you can use it as a, as a point of reference. Um, this is a complete outline of all the Federalist Papers, although we don't, we only need to know a handful of them. Um, and again, another, uh, another source of SCOTUS uh, case material, because it's not easy doing that stuff. And part of that is what we're going to do today. So I did want to show everybody that uh, I am going to make now. Um, well, actually, first, I'm sorry. Are you all still with me? Give me a, someone say yes. And yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm trying to make this interesting for you as, as best I can in this environment. 
Um, and I also have a thousand things open here. So you all still seeing my screen? Do you see Congressional Behavior 2.3? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so what you all should have done by now has annotated this, okay? So we have 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. Topics 2.1 through 2.3 should now be annotated through CAMI and submitted, okay? You should also have done in your Unit 2 notebook all the way to 2.3, the, the Google slide, all the way to 2.3, all right? Now, I didn't want to go on. I, 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 this, I told you guys, this unit is chock full of the minutia of government, like how it actually works now. Remember unit one was all the, ideolo the, the ideologies, the philosophies, okay? You know, uh, constitution, here it is now in black and white. Okay, now this unit two is all about the workings, the actual cogs and wheels of working of government. For some people it's gonna be fascinating, for other people it could seem tedious and boring, okay? I can't really control that. It's information though that you need to know um, in order to, you know, first of all, be a better well-informed citizen, but obviously you're gonna be asked this kind of stuff on the AP exam. Um, so I wanted to just go over a couple of the concepts here. It will be impossible. My goal is to get through unit two by, by uh, the holiday break, okay? That goes all the way up to 2.15. So we're on 2.3 right now. I won't be able to take these readings and every day go over the reading. What, what I envision the next three and a half weeks to look like for us, and the goal is to get through um, all of unit two by uh, the holiday break. My, my vision for this is that you do the reading at night and then the class time, whether we're still all virtual or half of us here, whatever the case may be, that's the sort of talking and activity portion. Okay, so this will probably be the last time that I look at the reading and sort of like go over the reading with you. That really has to be an AP student, really has to be able to do the reading on their own annotate, take notes on their own, get what they need to get from the reading. And then of course you've annotated so you can go back and refer. Guys, I don't expect you to remember everything and every topic because you read it one time, okay? But that's kind of how I, I, I envision this going. Otherwise we'll be stuck on unit two for the next three months, okay? So a couple of things that I wanted to point out. Um, all right, so I'm gonna jump right into the content now, all right? so. Party polarization, all right, because this is called about congressional behavior, all right? So one of the things that I want to point out to you, if you don't already know it, is that the, um, the parties have become very far apart in recent times, meaning that the conservative party, and we're going to learn more about the parties in units four and five, but you know enough about the parties now, just from even watching the election, that you have a, the Republican Party has over the years, I would say probably since even the year 2000, let's say, I'm just kind of picking that as a point, but the Republican Party has gone further and further to the right, more conservative, and the Democratic Party over the years has gone further, further left, okay? Now, what you have is this big gaping void in the middle. There was a time where there was such a thing as a moderate Democrat or a liberal Republican, those, those existed for many, many years, okay? You had Democrats in the South who uh, voted in a way that you would go, wow, they must be, they must be um, uh, you know, uh, hard right. They must be, you know, Republicans, but they're not. They're Democrats, but they shared uh, many of the viewpoints as, as conservatives did and vice versa. You have people who are Republicans who are people who, uh, you know, basically believe in smaller government, believe in uh, entrepreneurship, right? More freedoms, but they were more liberal, meaning they socially, they were fine with gay marriage or they were fine with legalizing marijuana, right? So, you know, you, you had this, this big sort of middle ground that a lot of things got settled a little bit easier. Legislation was able to pass through Congress because Congress was made up of people that were more moderate, okay? The, 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 the far right and far left really were fringe and they didn't dominate. But over the years now, you're having a situation where the parties have gotten further and further and further away from their center, okay? And what is dominating Congress right now, as you see, are these radical right and radical left, however you wanna put it, uh, viewpoints. And of course, when you have two viewpoints that are polar opposites from one another, 
what do you think the chances of finding a middle ground are going to be? Hmm. Anyone? What do you think? Don't be afraid to talk. I won't mock you that much. I mean, I, I think it'd be pretty hard. It would be really hard. Yes. Because you're coming from, it's almost like we're speaking two different languages. You're like, what, what, what are you, huh? All right. We were talking about uh, before the break, abortion, right? It, it won't surprise you to learn that the conservative, the Republican Party is pro-life. That's the viewpoint of the, of the Republican Party. And you won't be surprised to learn that the Democratic Party is pro-choice. Okay. You're talking about the same subject matter. It's the same content, but you have polar opposite viewpoints on how to deal with this same subject. So naturally to, to, to pass any type of legislation, it is going to be really, really, really hard to do. You're going to have less compromise because there's no incentive to compromise. It's become my side must win and your side must lose. This is how we stay in power. So politics really have shifted, I would say, it's fair to say, I mean, I would, I, you can trace this back even further than year 2000. I'm, I'm using the year 2000 sort of as a benchmark. Okay. You, you know, how, you should, guys should know how history works by now. There's never a specific, like, this is the date that the Renaissance began. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. There's always a blur of time periods, but there's less uh, compromise, right? There's um, more filibuster. You, you read about filibuster in the last topic, right? Where you basically can talk until time runs out on the bill, okay? Um, you, you, you try, you know, before we can get a vote in, you can stand up there and just, I mean, you can literally read from a recipe book and just sit there and read out of it and then get another book. You know, the one thing you can't do is you can't sit down, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't get a drink of water, otherwise then you yield the floor and then someone can put the motion to a vote. Now, who remembers from 2.2, topic 2.2, how can you stop a filibuster? Anyone? Isn't it like a two third vote? I don't remember the ratio. All right. So in the Senate, because the Senate is where you can filibuster. Okay. In the Senate, I think that was Logan who was saying that. Um, you need. That was Yosef. Oh, it was Yosef. I'm sorry. You guys almost sound alike. I don't. I can't see who's on the screen right now because I have my whole screen share up. But good job, Yosef. Uh, I know it's Joseph, but it's fun to say Yosef. Um, sure. I'm sure you hate it, right? Do you hate it? Um, I have mixed feelings on it. Mixed feelings. All right. Well, then good. I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep uh, workshopping it and see, see how you feel about it. Makes it sound more sophisticated. I think Joseph, Joseph, Joseph's very yeah, vanilla. Joseph is like, Ooh, Joseph. That sounds like a, a well-educated cat. Anyway, um, you can make a motion on the floor. You would need to know though, ahead of time that you get 60 votes. It's called cloture. Okay. It sounds like closure, cloture, cloture. C L O T U R E. So if you can get six, if you can get sixty senators uh, that are going to go ahead and put the motion to a vote, you can stop a Philadelphia buster. Now, in our divided Congress, where you know uh, fifty-one in, in the, the the past Congress was fifty-one Republican, forty-nine Democrats. Do you think you're going to get nine Democrats to swing the Republicans' way? What do you think the chances of that happening? Oh, I know, Mr. Lee, Welcome. it's none, right? So even though that is there, cloture is there, uh, it is very unlikely along these party lines that we just discussed, it's very unlikely that you're going to get nine senators. So the filibuster can just go and go and go and go and go, okay? Um, uh, the last one uh, was Nancy Pelosi in 2018 uh, for DACA. Um, she, uh, she filibustered for eight hours, so they couldn't vote on the, uh, you know, the, the Dreamers uh, bill. Um, under under President Trump. So, you know, this stuff still happens in Congress. So that's how you can end a filibuster, but you would need 60 senators to agree to vote and you're not gonna get that along party lines. So that's the effects of what we call polarization. And I just wanted to point it out. The parties really have become more polarized. And when that happens, you have a divided government. An example was in 2016, right? Remember, uh, Obak, Obak, Barack Obama, uh, nominated Merrick Garland for the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice, um, uh, what's his face? Justice, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Anyway, I'll, it'll come to me as I'm talking. 
uh, he died, Republican uh, or, or conservative uh, Supreme Court justice. And um, it's the president's absolute constitutional, uh, a constitutional right to nominate another justice, right? Just like Trump did uh, with, uh, he's nominated three people to the court during his presidency, but just this, this last one with Amy Coney Barrett, um, you know, and the, and the Democrats were like, you can't do you know, No, yes, I can. It is, it is the right of the president. It is part of my constitutional authority to nominate someone to the court. And it's the Senate's constitutional authority to either confirm or deny the president's um, uh, uh, nomination, right? So there was nothing illegal that was done in this past Supreme Court justice nomination. What the Democrats, the point they were making was like, whoa, 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 back in 2016, okay, President Obama named Merrick Garland to the court, and you guys, the Senate, who was controlled by the Republicans at that point, the Senate refused to hold confirmation hearings, okay, they because they felt that, well, President Obama, their reasoning was President Obama is a lame duck, meaning he's on his way out. And before he gets to name a, a Supreme Court justice, as we all know, something that is really important now in the world of politics, right? We feel that we should give the, the, the American people through their, through their voting of this 2016 presidential election coming in November, we feel that whoever is president then should get to pick this Supreme Court justice. So they, they really kind of you know pulled a fast one there, all right? That's why the Democrats this time around were saying, whoa, 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 well, you did the same, you did this in 2016, and now all of a sudden you want to rush this confirmation through, right? So it was this just divided government, okay? There, there was no sort of common ground there. So that's an example of that, right? Now, why is this important? Well, because partisanship leads to certain voting models. And there are three sort of uh, models in which someone who is a an elected official a representative will govern and will honor their constituents the constituents is the term for the people who you represent so if you are someone from a house of representatives from this that represents this district your constituents are the people who live in this district okay I'm, I'm not saying Ben Salem school district the, the district that is in the area of Bucks County right so there is uh, the one model, which is called the trustee model, okay? And this happens a lot in the Senate, all right? For reasons we'll talk about in a second. So the Senate trustee model is that the representatives believe that their constituents trust them to use their best judgment. Regardless of how I feel as a con constituent, I'm, I'm trusting you as my elected representative you're going to be there for a reason because you're more informed than I am. You're more educated on the subjects that you're going of legislation, how to read laws. You're maybe more educated on procedures of lawmaking in this country. You're more familiar with the Constitution. So that's called the trustee model. Okay, the the, the constituents trust you to go and make the right decisions. Right. The other model, sort of the opposite of that, is called the delegate model. And even these words kind of. The, the name of it gives you an idea of what it is. So the delegate model is that the representative should represent the views of his or her constituents, right? I am just, as, as the rep representative from this district, I am the mere voice of my people. I am not gonna go with my own personal feelings. I have a job, I was, I was voted for and elected by the people who live here and the overwhelming majority of people who live here want this to happen. So I'm going to vote because this is what they want. That's called the delegate model. And then, of course, you have the one that's sort of in between, which is called the political, the politico. And you can see the word political is in there. And whenever someone is acting political, essentially, what are they doing? They are acting on the current mood right now. Okay. So if I'm a, a, a representative, if I'm a, an elected official, I'm going to look and see, even though I'm, I kind of know what I think I want to do on this particular law that we're going to vote on, let's say, I'm going to take the temperature and the pulse of the people that I represent. And maybe I have an election coming up very soon. And the people are going to be more favorable to voting for me again, if I truly represent what they want, even though maybe it's against my own self-interest, or maybe it's against 
what I really think should happen. Maybe I think that this particular law will be better overall for us in the future, but because I want to get elected again, because I'm up for re-election next year, I'm going to vote based on what the majority of the people where I live want to vote. Now, out of all the models here, which one do you think is probably the most common in the House of Representatives? The delegate. Delegate, for sure. Okay. And you could also make the, the argument for Politica, right? In other words, House of Representatives, as we know, every two years, you're up for re-election. Every two years. Okay. And the, again, the founding fathers designed that house that way. They wanted the House of Representatives to be the voice of the people. They wanted the Senate to be the voice of the states. Okay. Big difference because you, you might go, well, wait a second. Don't the people make up the state? Yes. Okay. But remember, the Senate, six year terms. Okay. So they're less likely to have to worry about um, the popular opinion at the time, which remember, popular opinion doesn't always mean a good thing. Okay, it doesn't always mean it. Imagine right now if 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 the popular opinion was, you know, we shouldn't wear, we sh we don't need to wear a mask. I, I we we it's it's a it's an assault on our freedom. Okay, now you know, just because there's a popular craze doesn't mean that that's correct. It could be completely against science, but because enough people believe or maybe are misinformed about something, they all join the bandwagon and go, okay, yeah, the masks are come on, we can't we can't force people to do that, right? Well. You know, if, if I'm in the Senate, I, I just got elected, right? I, my, my next term is not for another six years. So I am more free to make the unpopular decision because I went, oh, I've actually met with the scientists and, and they're saying, look, the mask wearing thing really will help cut down the spread of coronavirus. So even though I know I'm going to catch some flack for my constituents because I voted against what they wanted, okay, I'm more likely to do that because I have six years to make it up to them. I have six years of, of voting on other things where people will most likely forget about it, where the House of Representatives are more going to be more likely to go with the flow. Because if I want to get reelected again, a, a, a vote that I take today, two years from now, people are still going to very much remember it. Okay. So I want you guys just, you know, again, what you would be asked on, on in an exam is, can you, can you name the three ways that Congress behaves in, in terms of how they vote? Well, there's the one where it's like, hey, trust me, I got this. You guys don't know what you're talking about. That's why you sent me. Don't worry, I'll, I'll vote. I'll vote to take care of you, okay? Trust me, the trustee. There's the word trust. I trust you, dear representative, you go do it, okay? Delegate, okay? I am, instead of me using the vote based on me as representative, I'm sort of delegating that to what do you guys wanna do? Okay, cool, that's how I'm gonna vote. And then the political model really is a, a combination of the two because you're, you're playing politics, okay? Now, what does that lead to? Well, it leads to redistricting. Now, the reason why I'm spending time on this part of the reading is because we're going to nail two Supreme Court cases here today and tomorrow, okay? Two of your 15 required. So we did McCulloch versus Maryland, okay, before Thanksgiving. Now we're going to, that was one of the 15. Now we're going to hit two. Bang, bang, back to back. Redistricting. Okay, let's talk about how, how places redistrict. Okay, so every 10 years, there's a census. We just did it, 2020. Okay, and in fact, there's a court uh, a case going to the Supreme Court where Trump is, uh, didn't want um, anyone who is um, an illegal immigrant to be counted in the census, where the Supreme Court ruled on this in the past and said, look, just because they're illegal in terms of they're not citizens, they still live here. They're still part of our society and we have to uh, uh, count them because they're going to need resources because they're humans and they're living here, right? Now, again, depending on how you feel, you, you might say, well, I'm sorry, illegal. You, no, you shouldn't be counted. That, that, you should be a citizen here to receive any of the, any of the benefits of, of society, all right? Any, any um, social safety nets and things like that. We could talk about that forever, okay? But what is happening here is every 10 years we go around and we take this very it's very expensive but we count okay who lives where why because this determines how the 435 representatives in the house of representatives how that number gets distributed across the country meaning 
there's always 435 seats. We don't add or subtract seats to that number. There are 435 seats available in the House of Representatives. How we determine what's how each state gets that amount is based on their population, okay? So we're gonna find out once they're done all the counting and it's gonna go to Congress, there's going to be a reapportionment, meaning it's possible that Pennsylvania gains a seat or two, or Pennsylvania could lose a seat or two, and that goes to another state, okay? So again, we're not gonna increase the 435 representatives. That's a, that's, that number's locked. What's not locked in is the amount that each state gets. Now, why is that important? Anyone? Why do you care about how many representatives you get in the House of Representatives? I guess then your state has more influence. I don't know. Yeah, well, sure. You get more of a voice for, for sure. You, you'd want that. You want, you'd want like, you know, us, Pennsylvania, you, you would want more seats in the House of Representatives, right? What, what else, though? What other major important thing happens that's based on the amount of representatives you have in the House of Representatives? Elector College Fits. Oh, thank the Lord. Was that Katie? Was that you, Katie? Yep. Thank you, Katie. The Electoral College folks. Okay, remember them? Just did a whole big thing on them. Presidential election. Still a big topic of discussion right now as the former, well, still current president is still claiming somehow that he won and uh, has lost the election now, I think, 27 times in a row. Um, but the Electoral College, yeah, you get more representation in the Electoral College that way, okay? More votes for president, right? Which is a big deal, obviously, as you can see, okay? So the census is important, all right? So when you guys, you'll be, you'll be participating in the next one, uh, 2030, make sure you fill it out. Make, I did mine on my phone. Okay, it's not a hassle. It's not the government tracking you. It's not, you know, Big Brother's going to get you. No, this is how you get counted, right? This is how we decide funding in your area. It's based on population. Okay, this is why uh, the Supreme Court ruled to we, we're going to still count illegal immigrants to this country because they still need to use resources. Okay, and if they're going to be doing the work around the country, then let's face it, some in some instances, some instances, jobs that. Uh, we can't fill with, with other Americans. We have to also count them. All right. Are you guys with me so far? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Are you slightly interested in this subject? Yeah. Is it somewhat entertaining? Kind of. Oh, kind of. That hurts. That hurts. Right here. All right. I'm trying to make the best out of numbers. I'm trying to make fun out of numbers. So reapportionment, as I just said, 435 seats. Okay, so we're gonna find out. Now, what, guess what happens? Let's say Pennsylvania in its um, 18, I think is what we are, 18 districts. And then you get the two senators. That's why it's 20, okay, in our electoral votes. So there's 18 districts. Let's say Pennsylvania somehow pulls out our population. We get an extra seat. Okay, so now we have 19 districts. Well, guess what has to happen? Pennsylvania currently, right now, is divided up into 18 districts. So if we get awarded another seat in the House of Representatives, guess what the Pennsylvania State Legislature has to do? Add a new district. And to add a new district, what are you going to have to do? Create new borders. You're going to have to create all new borders. All right, which is called redistricting. Now, this is what's going to lead to our first Supreme Court case, um, uh, uh, Baker versus Carr. But before we get to good old Baker versus Carr, what's one of those things when you redistrict, what, what when you're redrawing those lines, what possibly could you do when you redraw those lines? One party in some district. 
All right. So you really blipped out there. I don't know who was just talking. It might be your connection. Who was who was that just then? Um, I was trying to talk to my computer's being weird. That's okay. You're on now. So what, can you repeat what you just said? You could try to lower one party's power by putting all their voters either together or by splitting them apart. Excellent. And what do we call that technique? Gerrymandering. How'd you know that? Did you know that? Or was you just following my arrow? Okay. Gerrymandering, yes. And it, which is legal to a point. All right. So that's where it's going to bring us now to what you're actually going to do today. And this is obviously going to go into tomorrow. We're going to nail down these two Supreme Court cases. So you should notice by now on Schoology, go ahead and open up. There's an assignment at the very, very top under the Zoom meetings. Uh, that says Monday, November 30th assignment, and it's gerrymandering and Baker versus Carr with two R's. So I'll give you a minute to open that up. You will be opening up a Google slide deck. Everyone's favorite. Go ahead and type your name where it says add your name here. How can this class be only 10 more minutes? How is that possible? Does it feel like it's been that long? Watch how you answer that question. Or did time fly? Are you guys normally this dead? Are you afraid to talk? No, I'm just tired. Okay. All right, we all good? Everyone's got it open? Yes? I'll take your silence as yes. All right, so first slide. Imagine dividing your city, Ben Salem, or town into five areas with a roughly equal number of people in each area. What would be the best way to do it? For example, would you use larger streets as borders or rely on areas that already exist, like a school enrollment areas or different neighborhoods? So again, there's no really right answer here. This is just sort of foreshadowing. You don't know a heck of a lot about gerrymandering or Baker versus Carr. So go ahead, I'll shut up, write your response here. Obviously, you know, delete that. And how, you have to divide up in five ways. What do you think is the best way to do it? Just not knowing much about anything. What do you think now currently is the best way? Go. I'll give you one minute. All right, we good? You don't need to write a novel. All right, first thing, we're going to engage you. Isn't that special? Every 10 years after current population figures through the census, most states redraw their legislative and congressional districts to ensure that each one has roughly the same number of people. It might seem like a boring bureaucratic process, but it has tremendous impact on the balance of power. And that is 100% true. In 37 states, the political party in power controls the redistricting process and often redraws district lines that give them a clear political advantage over the opposing party. And both parties do this, by the way. So this isn't just, oh, Republicans do it or Democrats do it. Both do it. This is a process known as gerrymandering, and it often plays a major role in determining the outcome of future elections because, you know, electoral college votes uh, get based on that. In this lesson, you will explore the redistricting process and consider possible reforms to make redistricting less partisan, okay? 
So it says, watch this video from the Washington Post for an overview of gerrymandering and what surprised you in this video. So let me open it up. You should be able to watch this with me. Actually, I might have it out. There it is. It's not YouTube. So, you want to know what gerrymandering is? First, let's start with Government 101. In the United States, each state elects a certain number of representatives based on the state's population. The larger your population, the more representatives you have. Each representative represents a district or a geographical area, including its voters. Ideally, we want to have a range of representatives who reflect the political views of the population across the state. But how do we decide who gets to vote for each representative? Let's look at an example. Suppose we have a very tiny state of 50 people. 30 of them belong to the blue party and 20 belong to the red party. And just our luck, they all live in a nice even grid with blues on one side of the state and reds on the other. Now, let's say we need to divide the state into five districts. Each district will send one representative to the house to represent the people. Fortunately, because our citizens live in a neatly ordered grid, it's easy to draw five lengthy districts, two for the reds and three for the blues. Voila! Perfectly proportional representation, just as the founders intended. Now, let's say instead that the blue party controls the state government, and they get to decide how the lines are drawn. Rather than draw districts horizontally, they draw them vertically, so that in each district there are six blues and four reds. With a comfortable blue majority in the state, each district elects a blue candidate to the House. The blues win five seats, and the reds don't get a single one. Oh well! Finally, what if the Red Party controls the state government? The Reds know they're at a numerical disadvantage, but with some creative boundary drawing, they can slice the blue population up such that they only get a majority in two districts. So despite making up 40% of the population, the Reds win 60% of the seats. Not bad. This process of redrawing district lines to give an advantage to one party over another is called gerrymandering, and it's nothing new. The term gerrymander is named after early 19th century Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry, who redrew the map of the Senate's districts in 1810 in order to weaken the opposing Federalist Party. Our example is of course a huge simplification. In the real world, people don't live in neatly ordered grids sorted by political party. But for politicians looking to give themselves an advantage at redistricting time, the process is exactly the same, and the consequences are very real. Gerrymandering is at least partly to blame for lopsided representation in the House seen in recent elections. And, it's been argued by the President, for political polarization, since representatives don't have to compromise hardline views in order to win seats. All right. So, I mean, that was very quick, but a lot of information packed into that. Gerrymandering after the governor, whose last name was Jerry, and people thought that the district that he drew looked like a salamander. So they, they kept the Jerry and the Mander from Salamander, and this is why it's called gerrymandering. Um, and what it does is it allows you to be creative. It's not illegal, although we're gonna see where it is illegal um, tomorrow, but it, it's not illegal per se, but what it does is it allows a, a certain areas, if you're creative enough, a minority power to be in position to sort of trump the majority based on how they draw lines. And again, I want to be clear that that both parties do this. You will find evidence of this in that, that both parties do this. And what it allows too, like if I'm a representative from from the red party, okay, if I'm a representative from the red party, I don't really have to um, get too controversial with any subject because I already know I'm safe as a red party candidate that this red party is going to vote for me anyway. So I, I don't really have to worry too much about campaigning. Now, I do in the primaries, the general election, I don't have to win. I don't have to worry about because I'll beat the blue party person in my district. But in the primaries, that's where it gets tough. That's the in, in the in the uh, spring, which is an election a lot of people blow off because it's like, oh, we're not electing anyone big. Well, the primaries determine on who gets to run in the fall. OK, so you can get primary. Let's say if I'm a red party guy, but I'm not radical red. Right. And they decide to put up a candidate against me that's very radical red. Well, I have a chance of losing that seat. And now what happens is that process allows for the red party or the blue party. We're just using the colors as examples to become more radicalized, because if I want to stay in power. 
all right? And the, my district is going more radical red or it's going more radical blue. Well, then if I want to get elected to the House of Representatives again every two years, I have to make sure that I that I win those votes. So you can see where uh, how how this is where the politics really are important. So for people who are like, oh, I don't want to talk about politics. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, well, we have to talk about it. Otherwise, you're going to be left out. Okay, politics really are a way of life. Now, there's a better way to talk about them, and I'm hoping that you learn that from this class. Okay, but there's no avoiding politics. Politics has been here ever since humans, two humans met each other. They're, they started to play politics. All right, we're going to leave it here. There's nothing to submit today unless you haven't submitted your 2.1 to 2.3. Tomorrow, we're going to finish this. I'm not going to give you any homework today. Okay, but tomorrow we're going to finish this entire Google slide and also go into Reno versus Shaw. So at the end of class tomorrow, we're going to knock down two Supreme Court cases. So you should have three in the bank as far as you've been exposed to McCulloch versus Maryland and now Baker uh, and uh, Reno versus or Shaw versus Reno, Baker versus Carr call, call, uh, call and um, Shaw versus Reno. You have all those resources as well for review. Okay, any questions for me before we sign off? If not, um, yeah, go ahead. You have to submit the unit one notebook, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you haven't finished it up yet, um, let's try to get it in by Friday. Okay. Cool. Okay. So yeah, for anyone out there, unit one notebook, submit that bad boy. You have, uh, you know, through through the rest of the week to submit it. And let's get, let's get that one put away. And then make sure you make a copy of it on your Google Drive, folks. I'll see everyone tomorrow. All right, bye. Later.